What I'm telling you now, I'm telling you sincerely because I love you guys and I want you to be aware of what's happening and its significance. We're not just, you know, kicking tires here. This is real stuff we're talking about. So I'm going to read a statement to you that uh, you understand is true. It's a truism. You can find it in seventh volume of Bible commentary, 960, excuse me, 976, paragraph 9. Seven Bible commentary, 976.9. It's also in the Signs of the Times, May 6, 1897. And I'm going to read this statement uh, two or three times this afternoon, just the sentence. Trial and persecution will come on all who, in obedience to the word of God, refuse to worship this false Sabbath. Now here's the sentence I want you to remember. Force is the last resort of every false religion. Force is the last resort of every false religion. So you can understand that ISIS and that form of Islam is not a true religion or they wouldn't have to chop people's heads off. Does that make sense to you? This is a truism now. Force is the last resort of every false religion. The same can be said about the Roman Catholic Church and the millions of people that they killed, their only crime being they wouldn't bow to the Pope. Do you understand? Millions. So it's a false religion, just from the start. Okay, what we're going to look at this afternoon is something that will give you courage and confidence. A lot of people are scared to their wits end when they hear about persecution, but I'm going to show you reasons why it isn't and why God will be with us. Has God promised to be with us in difficult times? He has for sure. In the words of Paul, 2 Timothy, the third chapter, all that live godly in Christ will suffer persecution. So how does a person prepare for such treatment? I'm going to give you about four real quick stories so you can understand that people have gone through some very, very difficult times in the past. Most of you have heard the story of Marie Duran, who was 15 years old. She was honest, generous, and very much in love. Now you must remember that in the days that Marie Duran was living that people typically got married about that age, girls that age, uh, voluntarily, by, I must add, not forced into it by someone. At any rate, uh, she was looking for her wedding day with great anticipation, but the day never came because she rather spent her wedding day and many, many days after it in the most miserable prison in all of France. How did she end up there? What was her crime? How could she get out? Well, Marie's family had come under suspicion for being Protestants. When soldiers arrived looking for her brother, he was not there, so they arrested Marie instead, and she was dragged off to the dreaded Tower of Constance in South France, where she was to remain in stark isolation. At any moment, she could be free, rejoin her love, and begin the life that they had dreamed of together. The only price? Renounce her faith. Marie could not renounce her faith. Instead, she etched in small letters on the walls, the rock walls of her cell, over and over again, the words, resist. And resist is precisely what she did, not for a day, not a month, or even a year, but for 37 years, the prime of her life. Her crime, being a Protestant. While she was incarcerated, resist. Even to that day, you can visit that prison and see those words on her cell walls. She stood firm for God. There's a story in early Adventism. By the way, it's kind of interesting that she was finally released in December of 26, 1767, but her father and her husband-to-be had both been executed while she was incarcerated. So, I mean, it just doesn't end. Belarus is a small country, formerly part of the Soviet Union, nestled between Russia and the Ukraine. And from the Adventist Encyclopedia, we learn that Belarus Conference is a statement that says the work came to the Belarus in 1924 with the establishment of the congregation in the country or county of Brest. One might wonder why they actually celebrated the 100th anniversary in 2006, because 2024 to 2006, or excuse me, 1924 is not 100 years. But we found something very interesting from this unique story, and it is this. To human eyes, we don't always see what God sees. It so happens the word did begin earlier in Belarus than is known by our records. It was only after the breakup of the Soviet Union that there was access to government documents and historians were able to find out that the government files showed there were Seventh-day Adventists in Belarus as early as 1906. 
One of the reasons we don't have in our own archives the records of those early years is that it was during that time, the Russian Empire, when anyone followed any kind of religion, was a worshiper of God, he was put under great suspicion. And the leaders of our church in various parts of the empire were often sent off to what they called reorientation camps in the far north of Siberia. Apparently that's what happened to a number of our own leaders. There's one little short story that ends from that, comes from that period. And it was a pioneer worker, Mr. Lebsack, started the work in the area of what is now Belarus. He set up a few small companies of believers, traveled around giving Bible studies and training people, always under the threat of being arrested. One day as he was meeting with a group of believers, the security forces came and took him. And as they were escorting him down the center aisle, he called back to the believers, continue after I'm gone. The work of God is like a river. It cannot be stopped. They never heard from him again. He died in a security camp somewhere. Why did this man suffer persecution? Separation from friends and family. Why did he have to die far away from the notice of society? What crime did he commit? We all know the answer. He suffered indignity and death because of his religious convictions, but he stood firm for God. How on earth can people do that? That's what we're going to talk about this afternoon. Jesus said, I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So the words of the pioneer pastor from Belarus repeated the truth of that statement, the work of God is like a river, it cannot be stopped. There's hardly a person in this room who has not heard of John Huss. Very interestingly, one of the first reformers, remember that Martin Luther was in the 1500s, John Huss was in, born in 1415. He became a Roman Catholic priest in Bohemia in what is now the Czech Republic. He was a reformer and a master or teacher at Charles University in Prague. After John Wycliffe, the theorist, by the way, who was the Ecclesiastical Reformation leader, Huss is considered the first church reformer, and he lived, of course, before Luther and Calvin and Zwingli. But he was a Protestant, and it's very, very interesting that when he began to preach that the just shall live by faith, that struck terror in the hearts of the Roman church because that would take away people from their support and the, the, the doctrines of fear that they had. By the way, it's very interesting. The church, the Roman church has announced that next year will be a year of forgiveness and a year of mercy in the Roman Catholic Church. Are all of you tuned into that? I mean, this has been in the news and everything. The most amazing thing about it is I just got in my last issue of our Sunday Visitor that the year of our mercy has for sale indulgences. So you can be forgiven of any sin and they're for sale. So they're selling mercy. It's not free. Early on, Huss had stood alone in his labors, but finally he was joined by Jerome, who had been in England and accepted the teachings of John Wycliffe. By the way, at this time in history, there were three popes now contending for the supremacy, and they strife-filled Christendom with crime and tumult, not content with hurling anathemas, they resorted to temporal weapons. By the way, all three called the other the Antichrist, the only time they've ever spoken the truth. It's interesting. The gifts, the offices, the blessings of the church were offered for sale. And to cure the evils that were distracting the church in Europe, a general council was summoned to uh, meet in Constance in Germany. The council was called for the desire of the Emperor Sigismund by one of the three popes, John XXIII. And interestingly enough, the chief object was to be accomplished in the council was to get out of the schism to have only one pope and to root out heresy. So they invited John Huss to come because he was considered a heretic and they wanted to hear about him. He was granted by the king, Sigismund, and also by the pope, what is called a safe conduct. You come, we're guaranteeing your life will be spared. And we're not going to harm you in any way. But only two days after he came, they arrested and put him in prison. He never saw the delight of day again as a free man. Later, he was strapped to a wooden pole with brush stacked all around, a pitch on it, and he was burned alive at the stake. For what reason? Because of his conscience wanting to obey God rather than men. It's very simple. Well, it's interesting, to, when required to choose whether he would recant his doctrines and suffer death, he accepted the martyr's fate. But I want to share something with you now that probably some of you have read before but may not know. It's in Great Controversy, page 109. Even his enemies were struck with his heroic bearing. A zealous papist or priest follower, a papal follower, described the martyrdom of Huss and Jerome, who died soon after, and said, both of them uh, with constant mind bore themselves as the last hour approached. They prepared for the fire as if they were going to a marriage feast. They uttered no cry of pain, and when the flames arose, they began to sing hymns, and scarce the, could the vehemency of the flames stop their singing. How could you sing if you were being burned alive? Only by the grace of God. That's important to know. 
So I'm going to mention two more real quickly. One is John the Baptist. John the Baptist loved the outdoors, as you may know, spent most of his life in the wilderness. He enjoyed simple food, the feel of the wind and the water, the love of, of warmth of sun on his skin, and the freedom to enjoy nature. He became so popular a preacher that the Bible says that all of Judea went out to hear him. Did you hear the word I used? All of Judea, that's what the Bible says. Throngs of people, including the religious leaders, politicians, military brass, came out to hear him preach. He was a straight shooter. Many were convicted. God chose him to introduce Jesus, the Messiah, to all the world. This may be news to some of you today, but John the Baptist's entire ministry was only six months long. Three months he was preaching by Jordan River, and three months he was in Herod's prison, and then his head was chopped off. Now, it's kind of interesting that people ask the question to me sometimes. Matthew, Mark, Luke all record his story. John's murder, after he was murdered, Jesus said of him, of those born of women, there is none greater than John the Baptist. Now, Jesus was living in Judea at that time. Could he have prevented John from getting assassinated? What's the right answer? Yes. Why didn't he do it? I'm going to tell you now why he didn't, which is very interesting. And you can find the answer in Desire of Ages, page 224. Here's the answer. Gladly would he have delivered his faithful servant, but for the sake of thousands who in after years must pass from prison to death, John was to drink the cup of martyrdom, and as the followers of Jesus should languish in lonely cells or perish by the sword, the rack, or the faggot, apparently forsaken by God and man, what a stay to their hearts would be the thought that John the Baptist, to whose faithfulness Christ himself had borne witness, had passed through a similar experience to encourage others to be faithful. John did it, I can do it with God's help. And then this, the next paragraph is so interesting. God never leads his children otherwise than they would choose to be led if they could see the end from the beginning and discern the glory of the purpose which they are fulfilling as co-workers with him. And of all the gifts that heaven can bestow upon men, fellowship with Christ and his sufferings is the most weighty trust and the highest honor. So we just pray that God will help us be faithful. I remember years ago as a young man when I was working in the Gulf States Conference, I was traveling home from prayer meeting one night and I had been talking about the vastness of the universe and how God is controlling everything and how he's also thinking about us and I'm driving home in my little car and says, you know, God's thinking about me right now. And so I prayed out loud in my car and I said, God, you have my permission to do whatever it takes to save me. Have you ever said that? Anybody who gets to heaven will say heaven is cheap enough. That wasn't the end of my prayer though. I said, but please help me learn my lessons the easy way. Then, but the thing we're going to say now is help me to be faithful. He that is, you know, endures to the end will be saved. That's the point. So we need to pray for one another. Don't think because we know a lot we're, you know, safe. We don't want to be like Peter and think where everything's done. You understand? So the interesting thing I want to talk to you also about Apostle Paul. We studied about this in our Sabbath school lesson just about two weeks ago. But Paul was able to say of himself, by the way, how important was the Apostle Paul? He wrote almost half of the New Testament, 14 books if you count Hebrews, which I do. It's interesting that uh, this man did not live a life of pleasure, as you probably are aware. Five times he says, I received 40 stripes, save one. Five times he was beaten within an inch of his life and survived. Why didn't he get 40? Because the Jews thought that if you got 40 stripes, it would kill you. So he got five times he did that, 39 stripes. This is interesting. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Why did the people stop stoning him? They thought he was dead. Very interesting. Three times I suffered shipwreck at night in the day I've been in the deep. Now, even if you're a good swimmer, if you're out in the ocean, what are your thoughts? Some big shark's going to find me. You understand? He went through that. Journal in in the deep and then journeys often, perils of waters, perils of robbers, perils of my own, and so on. Besides those, there are many, many others. How did he stand up to this? You remember that in Philippi, Paul and Silas were arrested for what reason? Preaching Christ. They weren't burglars. They weren't gangsters. They weren't drug abusers. Do you understand? For their faith. And they beat them and then put them in stocks. Now, I don't know if you're aware what stocks are, but you've seen pictures of early, early pioneers in the United States. They put your feet in a thing which puts a clamp down on it so you can't move your hands the same way. And your back has you know, been beaten badly. You're in there. So what are you doing? You're cussing like a sailor, right? What were they doing? singing hymns. How could they ever do that? Singing hymns. 
And it says at midnight, this is uh, the book of Acts chapter 16, verse 25. Paul and Silas prayed, they sang praises to God, and the prisoners heard them. And their big earthquake came and so on. Amazing stuff. But at the end of all this that Paul said, he said, I'm now ready to be offered the time of my departures at hand. I've fought a good fight. I've finished the course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, but not to me only, but to also all of them that love his appearing. So if we love his appearing, same for us. Pretty good stuff. Now it is likely, we're going to transition into current event stuff here, it's likely that none of us will be thrown into a den of hungry lions or into the torture of the burning furnace. The restrictions are the, provided by the Eighth Amendment of our Constitution against cruel and unusual punishment being inflicted upon criminals probably will not happen. But some will. Listen carefully to what I'm going to tell you now. This is last day events, page 149 and 150. Some will be in prison. Some will be treated as slaves. Some will be thrust into prison and so on. Some will be exiled. The, very, the heart can be very cruel when God's fear and love are removed. Then also, many will be imprisoned. This is page 150. Many will flee for their lives from cities and towns. Many will be martyrs for the sake of standing in defense of truth. So you get the idea. Some will be thrown into prison. Some will be exiled. Some will be prisoners. Some will be treated as slaves. Some will flee for their lives. And some will be martyrs. But there's one thing everybody who leaves this earth alive will face, and that's that you will not be able to buy or sell sometime between when Jesus comes and right now. Now, how can we prepare for that time? That's what we're going to talk about at the Vespers tonight. Very interesting. So let's get back to the lion's den now. I'm going to give you something interesting. This is based pretty much on Daniel, the first six chapters, but primarily on Daniel 6. And so I'm going to show you a little picture. I'm not sure how it's going to come out. There it is. Can you see Daniel with the lions there? It's interesting because Daniel was willing to be devoured by lions rather than disobey God. Daniel 6, 4, and 5. No, so here's what we know about Daniel. A lot of the things we know quite well, the perspective of a children's story or a surface reader, uh, it's, so what's not to like about being in Daniel's shoes? He was of the royal line of Judah. He was not executed, but rather he was taken to the courts of Babylon. He was granted a place at the king's table. He and his friends were honored by the king of the world's richest empire. He and his friends were offered the best education possible with no expenses and no student loans. They were among the counselors and wise men of Babylon. God protected Daniel when he was thrown in the lion's den. He was prime minister of Babylon at the same time a prophet of God. And the only body person who was a prime minister under three empires, the Babylonians, the Medes, and the Persians. Pretty incredible. We're going to talk about that a little bit in just a minute. Now, the things I've just recounted to you are what the good stuff that because God protected him. But if you really like to know what day-to-day -day perspective of Daniel's life was all about, listen carefully to what I'm about to tell you about. The reality of Daniel's real life. In 605 B.C., the Babylonians, also known as the Chaldeans, besieged Jerusalem, the capital of Judah, and deported or killed most of its inhabitants. Now listen to the thoughts of the people being killed or deported. A century before, in 722 BC, the Assyrians had invaded the northern kingdom of Israel. You read about 2 Kings chapter 17. The Assyrian ruler Sargon forcefully transferred all the living Israelites to the eastern regions of Assyria, replaced them with Assyrian settlers of Babylonian origin and by the Kuthians, the future Samaritans. The majority of the Hebrew people disappear in the process. Ten of the twelve tribes of Israel are assimilated into the Assyrian population and are never heard from again. So now the little kingdom of Judah, the last surviving portion of the ancient kingdom of Babylon, or kingdom of David, is being destroyed and their only hope is the 70 year prophecy of Jeremiah that would be a, to the remnant would be returned. So Daniel's hometown in Jerusalem is destroyed. The temple is ransacked. Many of the golden vessels were taken to Babylon as a token of Daniel, the weakness of Daniel's God. Daniel's trip to Babylon from Jerusalem was not an air conditioned tour bus. He was marched on a trail of tears of sorts. You guys understand trail of tears in Tennessee, don't you? where many of the fellow men died on the way. The trip was more than a thousand miles, much of it through desert condition. The captives walked the entire way while being shackled around their feet with chains and chained together around their necks. As Isaiah 52 verse 2 tells us that. Chained and uprooted, the Judean captives will have lost everything, their past, their hope, their identities, their whole values. No record exists of how long that trip of a thousand miles of walking shackled foot to foot and neck to neck but the interesting part about it, it probably took uh, a long time because the return trip 
when they had animals to ride on 70 years later, took them four months. During the tedious weeks of what proved to be a death march for many, Daniel must have spent many hours thinking and praying. Because remember, it's like five-month trip. He pondered what he had learned in the scrolls of the prophets. When he had considered what the people were suffering, he realized the predictions of the prophets were true. He remembered God's covenant with Israel and knew that it was based on obedience to grace, through God's grace, and he resolved to serve him faithfully. So four teenagers were told about. Daniel and his friends felt helpless, forlorn as they passed into the streets of Babylon through its magnificent gates. After many months of hardship, filthy and tired, they peered into a sinister future and they were greeted with cheers, obscenities by crowds of gloating citizens. And these people faced the future with incredible faith and hope. By the way, upon Daniel's ar uh, arrival in Babylon, he and his friends were immediately part of the look down on minority. They were referred to as the captives of Judah. Sixty-six years later, when Belshazzar's feast, when he saw the handwriting on the wall, had no clue what it meant, none of the wise men knew what it meant, they said, there is a man among the captives of Judah that can tell you. So when they called Daniel and he says to Daniel, addressing him personally, are you one of the captives of Judah? And that's how he's referred to for his whole life. It gets worse. Daniel and his friends were humiliated by being castrated put under the command of the master of the eunuch, so no wife, no children, no girlfriends, no grandchildren, no normal family relations for the rest of their lives. This is not in the children's version. These descendants of King Hezekiah recognized they were being fulfilling the prediction of Isaiah the prophet, Isaiah 39, 3 to 8. When, remember when Hezekiah was healed and the Babylonians came? He should have told them about his God, but what did he do? showed them his wealth. And Isaiah said, they're going to come back and get this stuff, and they're going to take your kids and make them units in the palace of the king, which they actually did. So things were not looking up for these guys. Alive, yes, but humiliated and subjected to those over them. To take matters worse, even, they were frequently victims of jealousy and conniving by their colleagues. Our study right now is we're going to look at seven things that help us to understand how Daniel was able to go through this. So I'm going to put them up here so you can see what they're like. We're going to do them one at a time. The first one is Daniel made a total commitment to God. Now this is amazing. I'm going to suggest you jot these down because it's very, very important. This is all I'm going to show you this afternoon as far as PowerPoint. I have a whole big program this, after, this evening, but this one is just these seven points. First one, he made a total commitment. I feel confident his early training played a major part in his willingness to make this commitment. But sometime during his early years, he made a decision to follow God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The big question, have each of us made that decision? We used to sing a song when I was at Bass Academy years ago with young people. I have decided to follow Jesus. What's the next part? No turning back. No turning back. Real interesting. I, in the setting of all this humiliation of castration, lifetime captive status, loss of family connections, you get the situation. Daniel purposed in his heart, he decided that he would not defile himself. Anticipation of the coming uh, crisis, and in, in this anticipation, Ellen White wrote, now is the time for God's people to show themselves true to principle. When the religion of Christ is most held in contempt, when his law is most despised, then should our zeal be the warmest and our courage and firmness and the most unflinching. This is Fifth Testimonies 136. Now here's the part I've underlined in this interesting statement. To stand in defense of truth and righteousness when the majority forsake us, to fight the battles of the Lord when champions are few, this will be our test. It, at this time we must gather warmth from the coldness of others, courage from their cowardice, and loyalty from their treason. We're ready for number two, which is kind of interesting. Daniel honored his body as the temple of God. I'm just going to tell you a little brief story. I was traveling on United Airlines many years ago when they still served food on coast-to-coast -coast flights. And I had ordered a vegetarian meal. And they always served the special meals first or did in those days. And so when my meal was served, the guy beside me said, how did you get that special meal? I said, well, it's, it's, uh, you just can call ahead and, and let them know when you make your ticket, you can get it. I didn't say that this doesn't look, doesn't look like my wife's cooking, but you know, I, I was happy to get it. Anyway, he said, why did you choose vegetarian? And I said, well, there's about three reasons. The first one is that's the original diet for man, that God created man to eat plant-based food. A second one is I have a master's degree in public health from Loma Linda, and I just believe that if we follow that plan that is now scientifically, listen to the next word, proven to be true, we'll live better health and we'll live longer. It just doesn't seem longer, you do live longer. 
And then he said, well, what's the third reason? I said, the third reason is I'm planning to go to heaven soon, and the best I can tell everybody out there is a vegetarian. They will not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. Is this true? It is true. So we go on. Now this is interesting. Daniel requested a simple plant-based diet and water to drink. This meant no pork chops, no Big Macs, no sugary soft drinks, and no wine. The result was best looking guys and the smartest guys in the whole country. Is this true? Now the food didn't do it all totally on itself. I'll just tell you a little bit about it. Daniel and his friends did not adopt the vegetarian diet as a wonder drug or use it as the ideal diet as a means of spiritual perfection. Their dietary choice was a sign of their faith in God, and these young men took the risk and a risk of faith, and that's what saved them. We're told that because they honored their bodies the temple of God to their health and physical grace, God added wisdom, intelligence, scientific knowledge, and they recognized the whole as a gift from God. Now listen carefully to what I'm about to tell you now. Daniel could have rationalized a little sip of wine with meals would not hurt anything. Couldn't he have done that? Very interestingly, young men decided to leave liquor entirely alone, decided to remain teetotalers and give no appearance to, to evil uh, or sacrifice any of their brain cells to alcohol. Daniel could have reasoned that as a captive at the royal table and at the king's command, there's no other course than to pursue that to eat and drink what's set before them. But... They could have also added, being a thousand miles from home and no rabbis present, my parents are not here, who's going to know? But Daniel did not debate his options or go down that slippery slope of compromise. He made a firm decision that he would not defile himself with the king's delicacies or with the wine which he drank. He requested a trial period, but he had already expressed his final answer. Temperance, page 156, give this interesting statement. Right physical habits promote mental superiority. Intellectual power, physical stamina, and length of life depend upon immutable laws. Nature's God will not interfere to preserve men from the consequences of violating nature's requirements. He who strives for the mastery must be temperate in all things. Now I underline this next sentence. Daniel's clearness of mind and firmness of purpose, his power in acquiring knowledge and resisting temptation, were due in great degree to his plainness of diet in connection with his life of prayer. Pretty interesting stuff. Okay, we're ready for number three already. And this one is Daniel prayed on a regular and systematic basis. I remember something very interesting that happened to me years ago. I was working with ASI as the secretary at the general conference, and we took a trip of uh, ASI people, fathers and sons, to Guatemala. And we went the last Sabbath, we were there to a real pretty park down into a canyon where there was waterfalls and so on, and they had rented a bus. And it was really an old school bus that had worn out its life in Tennessee somewhere. And it's down there, you know, being reused again. Anyway, we got in the bus to start out from it. And the guy on the bus is a whole load of people. He started out, and when he left the clutch out, it wouldn't go forward in the first gear. Smoke was coming out from all underneath it. It just burnt the clutch out. So he says, Let, time to get off the bus. So we got off the bus, and the guy tried to get out of the hit canyon with no people on board. And still smoke got out everywhere, just pouring out. Just burnt the clutch clear up. And then he got under there with a wrench and tried to tighten it up to make it so it was always connected. Got in again, burned it up. We had a Guatemalan pastor with us. He says to us, it's time to pray. Maybe we should have prayed first. We prayed and he says, let's get back on the bus. And we got on the bus and it drove right out of there. Absolutely incredible. It's time to pray. Well, the big deal is we don't just pray when things are all bad news. We pray on a regular systematic basis. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. In Daniel 2, Daniel and his three friends prayed earnestly that God would spare their lives by revealing to them the king's dream and its interpretation. The Bible says, Daniel 2, 17 to 19, they sought mercies from the God of heaven. Now, I don't know how earnest you guys are in your prayers, but if your life depended on it the next day, believe me, you would pray earnestly. Would you not? This is pretty incredible. Later years, kind of interesting, Daniel, when the cares of state were heavy upon him, he was fixed, taxed to the utmost in his capacity, but he grew strong in the conflict with difficulties. He knew that in order to do his work well, he must have help from God. This is uh, Christian Temperance Bible Hygiene, page 23. Very interesting. He prayed three times a day, and God answered his prayers. Daniel placed himself on the side of God to keep his ways. The Lord placed himself on Daniel's side to keep him. Now the new king Darius was thinking about setting Daniel over the whole realm because an excellent spirit was found in him. Now this is kind of interesting. The other the provincial leaders had become jealous of Daniel and sought to find some fault in his business or personal affairs. 
Do you know why many of the congressmen do not speak out against others? The answer is simple. They'll turn on them and find some stuff in their lives. Is this true? It is. It's actually happened before several times. The real interesting part about it is they, they subjected Daniel to the third degree. I mean, they vetted him backwards and forwards. What were they able to find? The answer is nothing interesting. And what they said, there's nothing that we could do except we find fault because of his God. He, Daniel was ethically and morally impregnable. His rivals abandoned this approach, and they finally agreed that they could be entrapped only in regard to his law. It's very, very interesting that we see that. The prof, the Daniel's enemies counted on Daniel's firm adherence to principle for the success of their plan, and they were not mistaken in their estimate of his character. It's very, very interesting that one of the first things Daniel said in Daniel 2, when they prayed all night about getting the dream, he ran to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, and said, don't kill the wise man. First thing he said, don't kill these guys. He could have said, these guys are frauds. Kill every one of them. I know what the answer is. But he had mercy on them. Now, isn't that incredible? He had mercy on these guys, and they turned on him in chapter 6 and had him thrown into the lion's den. Same guys. The prophet boldly and quietly, humbly declared that no earthly power was, has a right to impose between the soul and God. Daniel stands in the world today as an example of Christian fearlessness and integrity. Now something interesting, Prophets and Kings, page 540 says, For an entire day the princes watched Daniel. Three times a day they saw him go to his chamber, and three times they heard his voice lifted in secret intercession before God. Now I want to tell you something interesting. In the Bible, faithful people prayed out loud. When Jesus was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane one time, they heard him praying and they said, Lord, teach us to pray. Jesus prayed out loud. Kind of interesting, my mother was a very godly woman and her ashes are resting in, a, in Tennessee here, just not far from us, uh, by Kathy's parents. And I want to just tell you something amazing. My brother and his wife had my mother living in their home for 19 years, the last 19 years of her life. When I mentioned what I just learned about praying out loud, I said that to my brother. I, uh, he actually saw a copy of it on YouTube and, and called me about it. And he said, our mother prayed out loud in all of her prayers. Isn't that incredible? Prayed out loud. And we're going to look at, talk about that in just a minute. When prayer becomes, oh, by the way, Daniel could have prayed in secret, couldn't he? Doesn't the Bible say go in closet, your closet and shut the door? Pretty interesting. The scriptures actually encourage that in Matthew chapter 6. But when prayer becomes trendy, it's better to pray alone. But when, when the authorities outlaw prayer, to pray in hiding is to imply that the king is greater than God. So Daniel prefers to die rather than to put a momentary hold on his religious life. The prophet chooses to remain faithful to God in his heart and in his actions. His courage is remarkable. Daniel knows what he's up against. He's not stupid, not in the action of a naive person, but actually anticipating the gravity of his decision. Daniel maintained his prayer life through discipline. Three times a, pray a day he prayed regularly. This was his habit. The interesting part about it, it says that Daniel 6, 10, and 13. It is likely that he developed this good habit by reading a psalm of David written nearly 500 years before. Now write this down because it's Psalm 55, and I have it underlined in my Bible now because it's very, very important. Psalm 55, 16, and 17 says, As for me, I will call upon God and the Lord will save me. Evening, morning, and at noon, or three times a day, I will pray and cry aloud and he shall hear my voice. Does God require audible speech for him to hear it? Can he read our minds? Obviously he can, but David suggested that we speak out loud. So why did Daniel open his windows toward Jerusalem? Very, very interesting. Because he remembered Solomon's prayer at the dedication of the temple in Jerusalem where Solomon had asked God to honor his people, wherever they were in the world, if they'd been taken to other countries, whatever, if they would pray toward Jerusalem, that they, he would hear their prayers. And that's 1 Kings chapter 8. So the orientation of Daniel's prayer toward the temple in Jerusalem was a gesture of hope. Hope for the return of the captives and hope for the restoration of the temple. Why would people pray out loud? Why should I pray out loud when I'm having my private devotions? One of the reasons is, am I the only person here who's ever had their mind wander while they're praying? Do you understand what I mean? You used to pray and then you start thinking about something you have to do today. Or have you ever gotten sleepy while praying? If you actually practice the presence of Jesus and pray out loud when you're having your personal prayers, it's just like he's there. Interestingly enough, when Jesus was 40 days old and his parents took him to dedication at the temple, please understand something amazing I'm going to tell you right now. This is interesting. Do not depend on your pastor for your spiritual growth. 
God ordained them. I'm a pastor, and I hope I'm blessing you guys today and this weekend. But what I'm going to tell you is we need to study the Bibles for ourselves and get it in our own hearts. And this is important because when Jesus' parents took him to the temple to dedicate him, they could have taken a lamb if they were wealthy enough, but if they didn't, they could just catch a pigeon or a wild dove and take a turtle dove. What did they take? A turtle dove. Most of you are aware of that. But when they took him, they offered their little offering, gave a few cents. The priest put his name in the book, said thank you, handed the baby back, and that was the end of it. He didn't know he had just held the Messiah. But on the way out, just a few seconds later, they're going down the steps of the temple after this official service. And an old man's coming up the steps, and he says, could I hold your baby? Well, okay, make sure you're on level ground here and everything. So they hand their baby over, and he says, Lord, I have seen the Messiah out loud. Now please let your servant die in peace. That was Simeon. How did he know it was Jesus? Because the Holy Spirit led his mind. He had told him that he wouldn't die until he saw the Messiah. Pretty interesting stuff. Okay, are we ready for number four? This one is very important. God planned to develop, uh, Daniel planned to develop his mind. And I'm not sure what I put down there. He applied himself to seek wisdom. And that's what I put. So here's the, here's the story here. I want to ask you guys a question, very interesting one. Do you think God can use anybody who's willing? Yes, by the power of his Holy Spirit. But I'm going to show you in a few minutes that if you seek additional education, you stand on vantage ground. And that's this important stuff. By the way, I used to share this with the students at Bass Academy. They love this one. Psalm 119, this is the one about the scriptures. David says, oh, how I love your law. It's my meditation all the day. You, through your commandments, make me wiser than my enemies, for they're ever with me. And then verse 99 says, I have more understanding than all of my teachers. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> for your testimonies are in my meditation. That's how you get to be smarter than your teachers. Very, very interesting. I understand more than the ancients because I keep your precepts. I've restrained my feet from every evil way that I may keep your word. Proverbs 9.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So I have been a speaker at the GYC thing, I think five different times. The last time I was in Baltimore speaking at GYC, and it's the break between Christmas and New Year's where thousands of young people get together to renew their commitment to God and share their faith and to learn things spiritually. Uh, one young man came up to me and he said, I was talking about how to finance a Christian education without getting deeply in debt. And this young man says, well, I'm not sure I want to go to college because my two favorite Adventist preachers don't even graduate from college. Probably every one of you could name two of them. This is interesting stuff. So I said, well, isn't it amazing how God is using them? Would you like to know what the counsel from the spirit of prophecy is? Here it is. It's real interesting to remember. It's Christ Object Lessons. That, by the way, was Ellen White's favorite book. She called it Parables. That was her favorite book. She says, Ministry of Healing is a favorite also. It contains the wisdom of the great physician. But my favorite one is Christ Object Lessons. And she donated the royalties of that to Adventist education, as you're likely aware. But anyway, Christ Object Lessons, COL 333. Just pretty simple, 333. So here it is. If placed under the control of his spirit, the more thoroughly the intellect is cultivated, the more effectively it can be used in service of God. The uneducated man who is consecrated to God, who longs to bless others, can be and is used by God in his service. But those who, with the same spirit of consecration, have had the benefit of a thorough education, can do much more extensive work for Christ. They stand on vantage ground. Now the next paragraph is very interesting. The Lord desires us to obtain all the education possible with the object in view of becoming millionaires. Think she said that? No way with the object in view of imparting our knowledge to others. None can know where or how they may be called to labor or to speak for God. Our Heavenly Father alone sees what he can make of men. There are before us possibilities which our feeble faith does not discern. Our minds should be so trained that if necessary, we can present the truths of his word before the highest earthly authorities in such a way as to glorify his name. Now, what are the highest earthly authorities? There's three branches of government. The Congress, the Supreme Court, and the President. Do you see what I'm saying? Pretty interesting stuff. We should not let slip even one opportunity of qualifying ourselves intellectually to work for God. Where is that found? Christ Object Lessons 333. Okay. Daniel and his friends, this is the last one on this number four. This is from Youth Instructor, August 6, 1903. I love this one because of what she says in the sentence. These youth determined to secure a well-balanced education. They became skilled in secular as well as religious knowledge, but they studied science without being corrupted. 
Isn't that amazing? Constantly praying, conscientiously studying, keeping themselves in touch with the unseen. They walked with God as Enoch did. Very fascinating. So what number are we ready for now? Number five, Daniel did not seek revenge. Now this is very interesting because I have three brothers and I can remember days when we were younger guys living at home when we would get in scraps or fights and wrestle each other and all that. Our first answer was, what are you guys doing? I would say, well, he hit me first. Have you guys ever said anything like that? He hit me first, so that means I get to hit him back. But this one is Daniel did not seek revenge. It's interesting, I told you earlier that he, his first public statement is don't destroy the wise men. Because the Lord says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. That's Jeremiah 51, 36. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. And so doing, you'll do what? What did we learn in a children's story today? Heap coals of fire on their head. So don't become overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. The followers of God are not to become vindictive. Daniel's plea was for the wise men of Babylon. Don't destroy them, for the king's secret is revealed. True, it's because of no merit of theirs that Daniel learned this, but he says they were God, he wanted God to save them. But their confession of their utter impotence in the matter was humiliation enough for them. Now listen carefully what I'm going to tell you now. They were saved, the wise men, because there was a God-fearing man among them. This should always be that way. Paul and Silas and Philippi were saved because the other prisoners were saved in the prison because of Paul and Silas. Is this true? We're all here. We're all saved. Often the wicked are benefited by the presence of the righteous. For the sake of Paul, all the lives of the people that sailed with him were saved on that boat that went shipwreck. What saves the world today? I was with Mark Finley in the cafeteria line at GC one day, and somebody, a visitor, asked him as we were going through line, where do you think we are in prophecy? And hardly even thinking, Mark says, we're in Revelation 7, where it says the angels are holding back the winds of strife. Because if the angels had let go, all hell would break loose on this earth, as you know. I mean, we can just see it peeking through now, which is quite incredible. For whose sake is it still spared? The Bible tells us for the sake of the few righteous that the people are saved, the the wicked. God's protection of the righteous protects even the wicked. So I'm going to read from Revelation 7, 1 to 3. After these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth holding the four winds of the earth. And the wind should not blow on the earth or on the sea or any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Now this is interesting. Why hasn't the Lord come back already? What are we told? Second Peter, the third chapter. The Lord is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to a knowledge of the truth. All will not accept, but all must hear, and all will be given a chance. I think God has given me dozens of chances. He is not obligated to do that. When the governor Felix came to hear Paul as a prisoner, you remember, he says, you almost persuade me to be a Christian. He didn't become one. That was his only chance he ever had in his life. God doesn't owe it to anybody other than one chance. But in the providence of God and the mercy of God, we're given other chances, as you know. So let us honor the creator of our youth, our creator of the earth and heaven, by representing his character of love. Now this next one, is going to be a little bit controversial, but I want to talk to you about it the way I understand it. And it is Daniel did not get involved in politics. Now listen carefully what I'm going to tell you now. How many people can you name that got involved in politics in the Bible? Or were high up in positions? I can think of three pretty easily. Who are they? Joseph, Daniel, Queen Esther. Anybody else? Neither of them ever campaigned. Neither of them raised a dollar of campaign funds. Neither of them ever asked for anybody's vote. They were all placed in that position because of their personal integrity, their wisdom, and their honoring God. That's pretty interesting, isn't it? So if I were to tell you that I was a Democrat, half the people in Greene County would hate me. Is this true? Most of you in this room probably. Yeah, (laughs) more than half. If I was to tell you I was a uh, Republican, the other half would hate me. So if I want to really support God's work in the world, I need to be apolitical, which means you're not affiliated with a party. So interestingly enough, I'm going to share some of this with you. Daniel did not give in politics, involved in politics. He never started a revolt. He was never involved in any conspiracies. He was so faithful that even his enemies could find no fault in him. 
He just did his job. He was apolitical. He served successive administrations under three empires, the Babylonians, the Medes, and the Persians. It's interesting also that when the, the German princes who had gone with Martin Luther and the Reformation during the time of the Reformation were asked to come and give their report of why they went with, with Luther, they were asked to speak at the Augsburg, Germany, the Council of Augsburg, which is very, very interesting, which was June 25, 1530. By the way, do any of you have calendars on your phone that you can go and see what time it was last year and what time it will be next year, what day of your birthday and all that? You go back to 1530 and it was a Sabbath when these guys are giving the, their testimony before the king. And they only did not make it a civil matter at all. It was only a matter of faith that they gave their testimony. Very, very interesting. In that august assembly, it's really interesting. The truths presented of the gospel were clearly set forth and the errors of the papal church were pointed out. Ellen White noted in Great Controversy 207, well has that day been pronounced the greatest day of the Reformation, one of the most glorious in the history of Christianity and of all mankind. We have some statements in the spirit of prophecy that uh, say that if we get into Daniel and Revelation and begin to study them, we'll have a transformation in our lives. Are you guys aware of that? So about two years ago, I was asked by the Religious Liberty Department in North American Division to be the speaker for their weekend in Washington, D.C., and I prayed earnestly about this, and I said, I better get into Daniel and Revelation. And so I made this sermon on Daniel and one on Daniel 3 on the lion's den, or excuse me, the fiery furnace. And I will just tell you, it transformed a lot of my own thinking, like how to pray and those kind of things. But in addition to that, I found out something else quite interesting. And I want to share with you. I have been very much into politics in my life. Not, you know, a campaign manager for anybody, but I've voted in every presidential election since I was old enough to vote, every one of them. And no telling, if the presidential election is over in the first hour, I still stay up all night almost to watch what the last state did. I'm very interested in this stuff. And, you know, I can, I can just tell you who ought to be impeached and all that stuff. The, the point I'm trying to make is that's not my rabbits to chase. As a Christian, we have the three angels' messages to preach, don't we? That's what we should be focused on. That's what we should be all about. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to still vote, but I'm going to tell you something else interesting. I'll share with you a little bit about this. There's fundamentals of education. There's a whole section on voting, but I'll just tell you something interesting that Ellen White says. Whatever the opinions you, this is second selected message, 236. Whatever the opinions you may entertain in regard to casting your vote in political elect questions, you are not to proclaim it by pen or voice. Our people need to be silent upon questions which have no relation to the third angel's message. So if I'm going to vote for somebody, I would not put a bumper sticker on my car anymore. I vote my conscience, but you should vote your conscience. Do you understand? This is pretty important stuff I'm telling you about here. We're not as the people to get involved in the same page, mixed up political questions. All would do well to take heed to the word of God. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers in political strife, nor bind themselves in their attachments. Gospel ministers are to keep their office free from all secular and political and things, employing all their time and talents in the lines of Christian effort. Second Testimonies 252. So here it is, election day. And so I'm going to wherever the precinct is in Greene County to vote. And so I have my Democrat and my Republican badge on. And I forget to take it off my suit when I come to church. So here you have Democrats and Republicans fighting over the potluck meal. Isn't that incredible? We should be apolitical, which means that it doesn't mean that we're stupid and we don't have an opinion, but no one needs to know what we're voting for. That's the whole idea. Okay. More on that another time. The interesting thing is, Daniel did not choose to be a foreign missionary, but he took advantage of this very desperate situation and did his best to represent God in it. I want to share one other little statement from uh, third message, let's see, Manuscript Release, this volume 3, page 40. God's people have been called out of the world that they may be separate from the world. It is not safe for them to take sides in politics, whatever their preference may be. They are ever to remember that they are one in Christ. God calls upon them to enter their names as under the theocracy. He cannot approve of those who link up with worldlings. So Daniel was not a Republican. Daniel was not a Democrat. He was an ambassador for God, and he was a true statesman. This is a big deal. We can spend a lot of time and money in these political races, and believe me, an important one is coming up. But we don't want to speak, do we want to speak for God, or do we want to speak for the Republican Party? That's pretty simple. Okay, now we're going to go to number, what's the next number? Okay. You think that's the last one? Yeah, seven's a perfect number, isn't it? Okay. Daniel took the long view. He looked to the end of time when God in heaven would set up a kingdom which would never be destroyed. Daniel kept his eyes on the prize. By faith, he looked forward to the city whose builder and maker is God that has walls of jasper and gates of pearl. 
You think you have a hard life? Try at age 15 to leave everything you have behind. Can't carry anything because you're shackled. You walk a thousand miles through the desert. You're castrated. You're thought of as a slave the whole rest of your life, thrown into the lion's den. You're, you're always mistreated by those who are around you. But God honored his faith. Think Daniel's going to be in heaven? No question. He says, be faithful unto death and I'll give you a crown of life. This is amazing stuff. He even won King Nebuchadnezzar, as you may remember. He looked forward to wearing the crown of righteousness. Daniel claimed the promise implied in Scripture and stated through the companion apocalyptic book of Revelation, be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. And in the words of Messiah about whom Daniel wrote in chapters 8 and 9 in his book, Jesus said, he endures to the end will be saved. Faith reaches to the unseen and grasps eternal realities. Heaven is very near to those who suffer for Christ's sake. Christ identifies his interests with the interests of his faithful people. He suffers in the person of his saints. Whoever touches his chosen people touches him. And that power is near to deliver from physical harm or distress, also near to save from disaster or great evil, but making it possible for the servant of God to maintain his integrity under all circumstances and to triumph. We have some interesting things. Most of you are very familiar with Romans the 8th chapter. What can take us out of God's hand? Can persecution, can suffering, can trial? What's the answer? Nothing. Hebrews, also after the great faith chapter, these faithful people who were fed to lions, sawn in two and all of that, many other great people, it starts out chapter 12. Therefore, we also, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily besets us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. He's also set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Though our lives may be a real mess now, one crisis after another, we must recognize, as did Daniel, that the better day is coming and God has promised that. The interesting part about it, the faith of the Christian is not just pie in the sky someday. Remember that atheist rulers of this world have said that religion is the opiate of the people. You have so much problem, you have to believe in God to make it bearable. That's not the way it is. What I've told you about last night and today is something that should make you believe that Ellen White was a true prophet. Because she wrote a hundred years ago this would happen, and it is happening. People used to think the Adventists were paranoid and thought there was a Sunday law behind every rock and every bush, but now we're seeing the real things getting together. You understand. I have a whole seminar on, on Sunday, and things are happening all over the world. It's, it's amazing, really. And the Pope, has, I told you, has spoken to the, the European Union and also to the Congress now. Is there any higher authority he could go to to speak? You, you just imagine what it is. God wants us to be ready. So I'm going to read something to you. It's Revelation 21. And uh, we can all go there. Revelation 21, 1 to 5. Maybe we should, well, I'll, we'll do that. Revelation 21, 1 to 5. This should be a, somebody's Bible underlined very importantly. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. Why do you think John said there was no more sea? Where was he writing? From an island. Just, you know, they, they're not sure whether anybody's ever escaped from Alcatraz. Some guys tried it on inner tubes or whatever, and they never found him again. So they either survived or they drowned. But he's on this island. There was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city of the New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. He will dwell with them, and so they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and they should, and be their God. Now, I like verse 4 because it's so incredible. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Is that good news or not? It is good news, my friends, to boss everybody here. It's, it's pretty amazing when you see that. There's probably not a person here who hasn't had, uh, lost a loved one or gone through some serious illness or some problem, experienced pain yourself, and you see these kind of things, and you just wonder, is this all there is in life? And God has promised something much better. Now, remember what I read last night from Daniel 2, 44 and 45? This is the dream. The interpretation is sure. Remember that? It's true. Notice what John says after saying what I just showed you in verse 5. Then he sat on the throne and said, Behold, I make all things new. And said to me, Write, for these are true and faithful count on it. It's very valuable to know that it's true and faithful. So the questions that I have as we close today is, do you want to live 
a life above reproach? Do you want to prepare yourself for what's ahead? Are you planning to go to heaven soon and take your place with holy beings? That's the big question. And if it's so, then you want to have hope and confidence and strength of Jesus in your life. You can do so by following the example of people who have done it before. Like Daniel, like John the Baptist, be prepared for whatever may come. We're not just in this because we we're looking for sunny days, are we? Some rain must fall in everyone's life, as you probably are aware. So making a firm commitment to follow Jesus. You know, some of us can be real stubborn on other things that don't make a hill of beans. You know, don't talk to your spouse for three days or something like that. You, you know, the no talk stuff. This, this is goofy. People can be really powerful. But can you make a decision for God? No matter what, I'm going to be faithful. That's the idea. Make a decision to honor God as the temple of God. Your body is the temple of God. I'm going to tell you something very interesting. It may be different for some people than others, but I believe that we should embrace and thank God for the Adventist health message. I really believe that. It's very, very valuable to me. Not meritorious in any way, but don't you like to save all the brain cells you can and be healthy and strong? It's important to me to see that. And also deciding to be regular and systematic in your prayer life, not just in emergencies, but in your daily living. Develop our minds by reading good material. It is shocking to me to know that in the United States, when a new video game comes out, grown men take the work off, day off work to go home and play the video game. Do you believe I'm telling you the truth about this? Absolutely true. People waste hours and hours with television, computers, video game, even Facebook and all kinds of goofy stuff. And how much time are we spending in God's Word? The real deal is, I was sent directions of how to get here and I'm sure it would have taken me easily. But I've learned to trust my GPS, so I plugged it in, Strawberry Plains, and it took me exactly right here. No wrong turns at all. This is the GPS of the Christian right here. So just get into it and learn to trust it. It'll be your faithful guide. Very important stuff that we're talking about here. So I want to understand that we don't need to seek revenge. God's going to take care of that in the judgment. And another reason, one of the reasons that Seventh-day Adventists don't persecute people that don't believe like us, because force is the last resort of every false religion. If we trust God and we're in a true religion, are we going to be mean people? We're going to be loving people. That will be the important thing to understand. So I will just share with you these important things that we understand. Take the long view in mind to see what God has in mind for us at the end. Even if you had to spend the rest of your life in solitary confinement, would it be worth it if you got to spend eternity with Jesus? Of course. So it's very important that we can understand. You can hardly make a trade comparison there. I'm going to actually close right now with a prayer. And if some of you have questions or comments about anything I've talked about, I'll be happy to talk with you about it. But it's such a nice day, it's probably a good day to get out and do some walking. So I've gone a little bit over the time I allowed it myself. But uh, it's about an hour's time. So remember, this evening we're going to talk about how to prepare for the time when you can't buy or sell. I've got some good practical information for you. And after the meeting tonight, I have brought a few of my books, so we'll have them out in the, in the back. The one tomorrow night, the one that I did last night, those three chapters in Sunday's Coming and the appendix are in that book. Anyway, let's have a prayer and then we'll, we'll close. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'll bless each of us as we contemplate the things that we've studied and learned. Help us to be faithful like Daniel. In spite of all that may come to us in this life, we pray that you'll say, heaven is cheap enough. We're going to be faithful. Well, you can count on us to be faithful. So when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? He will in Greenville and Green County and all the surrounding areas of people like these dear people. I pray that you'll help us not to be haughty and proud and confident, but to trust fully in you and to trust you to be with us through these difficult days ahead. Help us to be faithful and keep our eyes open ahead of us. In Jesus' name, amen.